We navigated our way out of Poole Harbour and headed out towards the western Solent. Our next destination was Newtown Creek Nature Reserve on the Isle of Wight, a passage of about 20 nautical miles. The weather was kind to us, although once again the wind failed to materialise, so we motored it. ridiculously optimistic. We had some distant views of the Needles, but some much closer views of Hurst Castle built by Henry VIII to defend the narrow entrance to the Solent. The castle is located at the end of Hurst Spit, a two and a half kilometre shingled bank protecting the entrance to the western Solent. These narrow waters can become quite turbulent as millions of cubic metres of water squeeze through. Even on a calm day, Distant Drummer was bounced about for a while until we broke through into the relatively calmer waters beyond. route took us past Yarmouth, after which time we needed to keep a sharp lookout for the entrance to Newtown Creek, which is marked by a red and white striped post with a Y-shaped mark on top of it. It's not that easy to see. Once through the narrow entrance, it's just a case of finding a bit of space and dropping the hook. We crept into an area called Clamakin Lake and took advantage of our shallow draft. This usually ensures that not too many other boats will anchor close by due to the shallowness of the water at low tide. The creek can get busy, but luckily we avoided the crowds during our stay. It's a beautiful place managed by the National Trust who may ask for a small donation during your stay. Back in medieval times, these shallow waters were artificially divided into salt pans where salt was produced using the evaporation technique. It was an important industry and a small town grew up around the water's edge. Now it's a nature reserve with a rich diversity of plants, birds and mammals, including harbour seals who raise their pups on the mudbanks. There are also osprey posts around the fringes of the reserve to encourage these raptors to stop off on their passages north. pretty much goes along the lines of, Robin, have we got an anchor light? To which I said, mm, yeah, it's probably the same light as the steaming light. So we found the switchboard and turned on the thing that said anchor light and look. We have one. So now there's no danger of anybody bumping into us at night. Life on the anchorage.
It was calm enough for me to climb the mast to attend to a couple of minor maintenance jobs. The view from the top was fantastic. We jumped aboard Betty and explored our new surroundings. We found some unusual pebbles with holes through the centre, one of which became a piece of trendy beach jewellery for Nikki. Auditioning to be extras in Poldark. We took Betty upstream to Shalfleet Quay and took a walk through the countryside to the new inn for a pint of Goddard Ale of White. Bizarrely, Newtown still has a town hall, but no town to go with it. The May Bank holiday brought out a few more visitors.
After a few idyllic days on the Isle of Wight, we headed another 20 nautical miles westward, up a flat calm Solent to our next destination, Pilsey Island, which is located within the confines of the Chichester Harbour Conservation Area. He is one big boy, isn't he? Yeah. Tagala. <laughs> Portsmouth Spinnaker Tower was clearly visible, as was No Man's Fort, one of the massive Napoleonic defences still present at the eastern end of the Solent. Norris Castle, a posh 18th century pile frequently visited by Queen Victoria, but in the end, she decided to buy Osborne House next door and do that up instead. A sea view of Osborne House. A good lookout is needed at all times on the Solent. It can get extremely busy with red funnel ferries constantly plying across to cows. We dropped the anchor just off Pilsey Island. The Chichester Conservation Area is vast, with acres of mudflats, many small islands and secluded anchorages. Pilsey only truly becomes an island at high water, and venturing beyond the strand line is restricted by the RSPB for conservation reasons. Needless to say, it wasn't long before the harbour master arrived to collect his dues. He was extremely helpful and gave us a useful leaflet about the conservation area, which also gave mention to Chichester's dark sky status, something we were to enjoy once darkness had fallen. It was a beautiful anchorage and although we only stayed for one night, it was definitely worth a visit. The sunset was particularly good. The following morning we elected to continue our voyage westwards heading around Selsey Bill and then along the coast to Brighton, about 35 nautical miles distant. The marina there is quite hard to spot from the sea so the GPS came in handy. Once inside, it's quite a big place constructed from scratch back in the 1970s and surrounded by shops and restaurants. We had a great day out touring around the town the highlight of which had to be the discovery of Quadrophenia Alley. The pavilion is quite special too. After a couple of days, we refuelled and headed back out into the English Channel, this time bound for Beachy Head and Eastbourne Sovereign Marina beyond.
It was a fairly short but quite rough passage with a following force four around Beachy Head. Steering down some of the waves was quite challenging, but thankfully Distant Drummer took it all in her stride, and before long we were safely inside the outer entrance to Sovereign Marina. It's a tidal marina, so a twin sea lock system allows you in and out. Once inside, it's quite similar to Brighton, although most of the surrounding buildings are residential. We stretched our legs and took a walk along the seafront to one of the Martello towers which line the coast here. They're a throwback to the threat posed by Napoleon back in the early 19th century. Opportunities for marinas and anchorages are less frequent along the Sussex coast, so our next passage to Dover would be quite a bit longer than those we had made so far. In the final film, we visit the White Cliffs of Dover, walk through the Channel Tunnel, and successfully dodge some cross-channel ferries.